executive director of NGO Advocacy uh, Life from Ukraine. So first of all, the most important rule, yeah, know your audience. So I want to know who you are. Are you the researchers or the advocates? or decision makers who works on research can you please raise your hands okay so like half of the group a bit more and who are the advocacy people okay just rather few of you and today maybe there are some other groups that i didn't identify journalist or someone else okay so basically the research journal oh there is a journal fantastic so we are lucky very we are very lucky indeed um, so, because I will be talking uh, today about some practical tips, both for the advocates and for the researchers. And um, I am so happy that uh, just before me we had Oksana Satiga presenting about Ukraine's seven-year plan and um, steps that Ukraine is currently taking to you know, comply with our international obligations. But also the biggest benefit for us, for Ukraine, is of course the public health benefit. And I'm extremely happy that we have this constructive dialogue because at the end sometimes um, tobacco control community tends to you know, take side and that's obvious that we have our side. But whenever we come to a tough question of wanting and getting some policy, we have to realize that there is another side. There is some very important technical issues and questions that, to be honest, we have no idea about. Because only the people who work in the government, who work uh, with multiple stakeholders, you saw that list, it's a huge one. We have no idea how to deal um, with that process. Only they can understand um, the burden, not just of the um, implementing the decision that was made uh, on a high level, but also, you know, uh, getting everything done in time. It's very demanding uh, job and it's very important task for us. Therefore, our role as the researchers, as the public health community, to make sure that we are there to help, to support, to motivate, um, and if necessary, it depends on your situation, of course, you know, maybe uh, uh, demand more. But uh, be in a constructive dialogue if it's possible and find the right person to build that dialogue. Of course, it takes years, you know, just not, it's not one year. Building the relationship between different groups, I mean, advocates, researchers, decision makers, media, it takes years, but I mean, we have to start. And um, here we are uh, having this dialogue. Uh, so, what do we do? What can we do to transform uh, policy relevant research into advocacy campaign? What are the first steps? Any ideas? Where would you start as a researcher or as an advocate? So, where do you start? Do you start with the research? Or you start with uh, identifying your policy and advocacy goals. You know, I will not, I will not jump into next slide until I get an answer from you. <laughs> so, you know, we still have like uh, 20 minutes. So, first one or second one? Let's do. Okay, let's do the voting. If you don't want to speak up, and you, you sh shouldn't be shy. Who would start with um, identifying? Uh, for, uh, like relevant uh, research ideas, proposals. Who would start with this one? Okay. And who would start with identifying policy objectives and advocacy goals? Okay. And the rest of you still didn't decide. Um, I mean, as a, as a tobacco control community, as a tobacco control advocate, for me, it's very clear. I I, mean, I don't need. I mean, I, I have all the data I need, I have all the evidence I need, I have all the proof. So I know we start uh, with the policy goals and advocacy objectives. And then, of course, together with other stakeholders, if you work with someone with the government, uh, within the government, or you work with someone within the, the parliament, that's your choice. But first of all, you have to understand which argument would work the best uh, for, for the guys with, to whom you have an access. If you don't have to someone uh, who, is in a, who, is, who is there, who makes decisions, then of course you have to identify those people. 
And then for someone, of course, the um, revenue arguments are the most important, and then comes the public health. But you know, you have to, from our perspective, you have to make your uh, policy relevant research relevant to concrete decision maker, or even if it's the ministry, are you there to support? So you have to actually start with, with what you are envisioning. So if you're envisioning a tax increase, then what arguments would work the best? Of course, I understand that the research is like, what, 20, 30, 40, 100 pages. That's great, you know. But um, decision makers, you know, that's not something that's going to convince them. It's even not something that they would be happy to, you know, get publicity out of there. So it's just the ground where you start, but it's important to understand where do you start. Do you start from identifying advocacy and policy goals and then go to the research or the other way around? So another question for you. I know you like you like you like questions. How good are we with advocacy writing? What is advocacy writing? How do researchers or advocacy people understand advocacy writing? And what is advocacy writing? Is it the same? So do we can we say that policy relevant research is more or less the same than advocacy research? Probably no. Probably no. Probably of course we have this like research, big paper, and then we have to make our way to having uh, advocacy relevant statement, infographic, whatever you prefer, that you will use to distribute on media based on what you will write your press release or the news or Facebook post or Instagram. Do you know your government, do they use Instagram or Facebook or Twitter or the decision makers? How, you, how do you circulate this information? You just send a letter along with the report, or you also tag your decision makers and policy makers in a Facebook post where you like, make one or two most important messages, and maybe you give a link to a huge report or just to the infographic. That's, that's a question that you have to ask yourself when you are on a stage of planning the advocacy campaign. And this is something that we as NGO do, because of course the work that the government does, we would not never be able to do. And there are the organizations and uh, the researchers and the team who, uh, who does the who do the research. And we are there basically to transform that very complicated, very official language to simple messages that are easy to understand because Decision makers, policy makers, media and public, um, they need and they want to hear some simple messages that they are able to understand and comprehend, even though maybe at the end, you know, we will end up realizing that it's not that simple, but you have to, you know, you have to decide and you have to make that step basically out of the research box and make some compromises because your messages will not be the same that you wrote in your policy research because they should be they should be very simple uh, to understand so basically we have to work but whenever we have a research then you have to identify the tools how to distribute that research how to get it uh, to the policy maker decision maker that you are working with if it's there just to support them like in our case the seven year plan and also the initiatives uh, before they were mostly initiated by the Ministry of Finance, by the government, then approved by the parliament. But then let's remember that um, there are certain stakeholders, and I mean, of course, the tobacco industry and some of their allies who are not in favor of that proposal. So your role in that particular case can be to get the necessary support and to basically make everybody recognize that tobacco tax increase is a popular policy that people support it, that it's pro people, it's about people, and that will just benefit from it. Very simple messages, again, as I said, you actually, you don't need to get very technical. The more technical you get, the less, the less information people will understand. I mean, I'm trying to speak very simple language and correct me if I'm getting, you know, too technical because then, you know, then I failed with my presentation. 
So some basic golden rules of advocacy writing, be clear, be interesting, be real, be persuasive. Um, again, whenever we want to have, get some information to the public, to the media, we have a, let's say, a press release or a news, and then we have an infographic, which basic, basically shows the increase of tobacco excise, increase of tobacco revenue, decrease of smoking prevalence. It should be as simple as possible, right? Um, promoting tobacco tax increase in Ukraine, I will be like, um, now, I will focus a bit more on Ukraine. So as I said, our role as NGO for the last couple of years was raising awareness among members of the parliament, because still, there are those members of the parliament uh, who rather believe in the messages that are presented by the industry, those messages that are related to illicit trade, to possible reduction of revenues, to uh, how poor the tobacco companies are, uh, that they suffer from tobacco tax increase, that they are the biggest taxpayers. That's their role, that's their job, that's what they do, that's what they are paid for. And uh, the public health community has to watch out for that and be able to uh, basically present the argument that, they, that would prove that they are wrong. Uh, promoting, of course, the evidence-based approach, we're very lucky having this um, background that Ukraine is the, um, signed the agreement uh, with the European Union, and the World Bank team in Ukraine also played a very important role they were uh, producing a research, they were calculating scenarios, they were involved also in the process of helping the government and working together with the civil society. So uh, just check out with your World Bank team or maybe some other international organization that might be interested in supporting your research and your advocacy campaign in your country. Uh, I already mentioned media advocacy and that this is important, basically signifying win-win impact. Uh, and if in your country, your uh, decision makers, the government, if they use, again, Twitter, Facebook, find them, follow them, tag them, comment their posts, ask them questions, attend the media events that they are attending. And if they are not raising taxes, come to the press conference where they are speaking and ask them about tobacco taxation. That's how you that's how you raise the attention of the public uh, to the uh, issue of uh, tobacco tax. Building a coalition is very important. You know, having partners who can not just, uh, you know, um, uh, be there for you, but inform you, support you, attend some of the meetings where the government are, and, you know, uh, spread the word when, if you are not there. So the bigger the coalition, the higher your chances in succeeding in uh, uh, transforming from just policy relevant research to successful advocacy campaign and to achieving your policy goal. And of course, the last but not least, exposing tobacco industry claims related to, again, illicit trade and some other issues. In Ukraine, two years ago, Transparency International of Ukraine conducted a monitoring of the tobacco industry interference in public health policy making policy making. So we have FCDC, Ukraine has an obligation to comply. There is Article 5.3. Therefore, it's completely legitimate for anti-corruption organizations to uh, um, work on this issue, to monitor and report what they found out. Uh, and if you have those organizations in your country, meet with them and uh, ask if they would be interested also to work on uh, 5.3, on transparency, um, that are related not just to tobacco tax, but tobacco control. So basically here you can see, uh, oh, sorry. here uh, it's just an infographic of some of the decision makers that um, were basically, that had some conflict of interest related to tobacco control. I won't go into the details. Um, so, again, as I said, make sure that you translate your research into very clear advocacy uh, messages and simplify it even further to persuade decision makers and get media attention. And of course, get ready for tobacco industry attacks. Like they will find uh, 
opinion leaders, economists, think tanks who will um, spread the word, who will share their messages, who will talk with decision makers uh, as well, who will have meetings. So just get ready and monitor that information because if you monitor, read the media articles from the tobacco people, just understand what kind of claim they are trying to make and then of course try to, you know, counteract and um, make sure that the messages that they are spreading, they are not the dominant messages. You have to, you have to um, counter them. Yeah. So here are some examples of visualizations. Some, some of them are in English. Those are the infographics of the uh, policy scenarios. Some of them were developed by the, by the World Bank. Some of them in the past were also developed by Konstantin uh, Krasovsky, who are here present and who has been uh, working on tobacco taxation in Ukraine for many years. So the basic idea and goal was, um, again, to communicate with the media and public and decision makers and show them um, what are the scenarios. So before the tobacco uh, tax increase, uh, we as a civil society were proposing our agenda, so of course like uh, we're saying let's increase by 30% or 40% and then there was a proposal from other members of the parliament or, uh, or the government and then we were basically showing uh, what would be the results uh, of, of that increase, how, how the price of cigarettes would change how the revenues would change and probably how, and how the consumption would uh, would change. And these three categories, they are probably the most significant one, they are easy to understand. Um, yeah. And other examples of visualization, that's when the um, inflation was increasing and we were basically showing that um, prices for red um, vegetables, um, sugar and something else were increasing when, when, when the tobacco actually didn't increase um, to the same high level. That was another argument. So I mean, why tobacco should be cheaper than milk, right? Um, another example of visualization that we were using, um, there are some pictures from the um, press events, media events, public street actions, uh, round tables, uh, examples of uh, SMM campaign, as I said, post uh, Facebook um, and how, how it can look like and how you can engage your followers and uh, related audience. So this is the last slide and it has the most words on it. You don't need to read it, but it's like a, it's more or less simple guideline. How do we start and what do we do? Uh, we gather the information, we analyze political landscape and identify priorities. Because depending on uh, with whom you would like to work and who is the focal point in your country, whether the parliament also has the power to initiate some changes, or whom it's easier to convince at this particular stage and who can influence whom. So, uh, Identify clear research, advocacy, and policy objectives. This is more or less the same. You know, if you want to uh, have a research that would help your government and parliament to increase tobacco taxes, then the idea is that your research and advocacy and policy objectives are related. Uh, partner with those organizations that already work uh, with the government and Ministry of Finance, such as World Bank, International Monetary Fund, some embassies, local think tanks, you probably know better. Um, develop or support the legislation. If you do already have a policy champion who works on taxation, who develop the, uh, the legislation, register the bill, so just, you know, identify your role. How, how, how are you trying to support them? How are you trying to, again, show to public decision makers, to media, that tobacco tax increase is something that people support. It's the policy that smokers support. This is the most important. It's, it's a, a popular policy. And um, the government or the decision maker, it will give them positive publicity at the end. It's something that it's very important to give to the to the politicians because we know that for them it's important to get re-elected. And if you will be able to give this message to them, then you know your chances of succeeding are higher. 
uh, conduct communications campaign. There are different tools how you can do it. And, and believe me, sometimes it's even more important to have, uh, let's say, modern communication campaign and don't just do, you know, the round tables, even, you know, some uh, press briefings, like short one, or even the social media. It, it's also really important part of your communication campaign. Don't forget to monitor the industry. Uh, if you have, uh, like, uh, if you can um, use uh, uh, different tools, not just, you know, to monitor the media, but to analyze what kind of proposals they are making to the government. If you can write a request for information and get their letters or their uh, proposal and understand what kind of point they are making, it will be easier for you uh, to identify how to make sure that um, some data that might not be correct, like we know about data on illicit trade, usually is exaggerated, make sure that you come back to the point of, you know, tobacco tax increase gives more revenue and it's good for health. Illicit trade, you know, if you have to speak about it, if you know that you will be speaking with something who is knowledgeable, of course you need to prepare. But in average and in general, usually when you speak with, with the government or decision makers, especially those who are top level, you don't get to speak about very technical details. It's very rather, they are very busy people. They don't have that much time about, uh, for speaking about uh, illicit trade, like in numbers and details. But if you do, if you, have, if you think that you will have the chance, of, of course, be prepared. Uh, engage the audience and stakeholders in celebrating success. Whenever you had a uh, tax increase, you don't just, you know, happy, and you work uh, on uh, spreading this information, making sure that everybody knows how great this is, that it's helping people to quit smoking, that it's helping young people not to start. It's actually ongoing work after you have a success you praise your government, you praise the decision maker who made it happen, and you make sure that um, this goes through the media and then it goes to the public. Monitor implementation, analyze results, and identify loopholes. There are always some loopholes that you can work on, like so if you need to simplify tax administration or work on combating forest land or you know, uh, making sure that uh, the authorities work on illicit trade, or something else, I mean, you, you know better, I mean, and then you start again. Um, overcoming challenges is an important part of any campaign. I mean, whenever you have some challenges, uh, you just need to adjust your campaign, uh, and again, work together with all of the partners that you have. So th this, this is, uh, is the final slide. Again, research, analyze, and present. If you just done a research and you publish it on your website and send it to the government, you know, it's not good enough. You have to, you have to do more. Um, again, tobacco tax increase is a win-win policy for the public and for the government. And it's supported by people. Uh, if you can get an international support, then it's great. Your chances are, are better. In our case, EU context and the international obligations, and actually the success of the previous years of increase in taxes are the important component of uh, tobacco tax increase. And remember that Article 6 is actually very connected to Article 5.3 because the industry, you know, they are in, not in favor of tobacco tax increase. And you actually uh, have to make sure that you know what they do and that if there are some meetings that they are having with the government decision makers and if they are public, you have to attend them. If they are not public, then of course you have to make sure that you can at least understand uh, what they were about or try to get the meeting yourself depends on your context it can be very different communication campaigns are crucial and simple visualization of your vision and um, past success and results are also important part of your research and campaign so we start with the research then we do advocacy and then uh, when you have a policy win you actually have to start again uh, on your campaign Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. Any questions? You have to be able to read.
did the research and then you know properly make sure that your advocacy messages match the, the, the research messages and um, and I also was trying to challenge the, the researchers. You have to be able to speak to the policymakers. We know it's not easy, but you know, I have great examples. Uh, I have great colleagues in my country uh, who has been doing both research and advocacy, and it's possible. And if you are a passionate tobacco control person, no matter researcher or an advocate, you have to do both. You have to challenge yourself because I don't know, depends on your country. Uh, if you don't have any NGOs there, then as a researcher, you have, you also have to do an advocacy if you want your research to transform into um, into a policy. So uh, of course, it's not the case for everybody. And if you don't have that people who can do who who is, for example, a researcher researcher, but also can do and want to do an advocacy, then of course you can find other people. But ideally. We are we are supposed to be a bit of a researchers and a bit of an advocates. Yes. To you know when we're talking to advocates, I think for me, you know, as a researcher, for me, that's important is to see the research to be uh, accepted by policymakers or at least you know let them pay attention. So in order to do that, um, I think it's important to understand what their issues is, what their motivation is, you know, what their you know, if they want to, you know, where they're in their public, you know, in their public position in order to achieve something. So better understand their goals and 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 their concerns. And this is how I think the research should sort of take research should that take in, in the consideration that they're designing their their study. Of course, we have our own research interests, and so, but it's um, it's sometimes we have to say not consider our own research interests, what we think is important, but we should listen to policymakers more. But at the same time, I think we should also educa uh, educate them about what is important that they should look at. So I think there should be some kind of a dialogue between policymakers and researchers. And that sort of, I think the, the advocates are sort of a, a, a connecting link. They can make, uh, they can help to, to break, you know, to do, uh, Sort of, you know, make that relationship or make that dialogue between the policymakers and researchers a little bit. Uh, they are like brokers in the relationship that I want to see that I want to see as well. And that's, and that's, uh... Where to go when they want to think about how to communicate their research before engaging doing research? Uh, so, do you proactively go to the research community? Do you read research papers? Do you identify gaps and, and go to university and research groups and tell them, you, you know, would you like to... to the government and decision makers, then it would probably be the best match, but really, really make sure that they didn't work with the industry because then it will be epic fail. Um, whenever you will be done with your research, then you would need to you know, find those decision makers whom you would convince that it's a good thing, or at least if they are neutral, and then you know just have a coffee with them if they are accessible. That's you know just having formal meetings with them uh, just before you know uh, uh, giving them a floor and, and publicity. Okay, so we have now. You come. You you you. We had coffee. We had lunch. You know, organize, brought them to dinner, still nothing. Then so they, they are not like saying that they are not interested or in the, the industry and the, they don't want to lose. What did they say? What are they doing? Exactly what you want to say. You know, they're they're the, they're the, they're the, they're the, you know, the big saver of us. We don't have school, they're consequently, because they are contributing <coughs> to our budget. I mean, we need budget for all that. So what do we do? Yeah, we all go through that with different issues. Sometimes it might look like there is no way. I mean, probably there are still those uh, decision makers with whom you didn't meet, whom you don't know. Um, <clears throat> maybe there are those who are directly collected, collected to the industry. Find that link. Make it public. Make sure that everybody knows that this decision maker is connected to, uh, to, the, to the tobacco industry. Uh, his daughter um, or son works for the industry or you know he gets some benefits from it so if it doesn't work you know in a constructive way 
and try to make that thing. I mean, it's a long way. It might not happen like in one year. Uh, this is another way to, you know, to try to refresh it, give it another risk, just to identify what is the conflict of interest, who benefits the most, do they meet with the interest? Try to make this information public. I, of course, I know that for our countries, you know, corruption in, let's say, corruption in uh, tobacco control is not such a big deal because we have a lot of other cases of corruption. Still, you have to make this information public. And some might, you know, some of them might withdraw their communication or at least not be that vocal about the industry. Um, and still try to, you know, speak to uh, some other decision makers to whom you didn't speak. Well, 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 let me just add, you see, it's, you see, it's, uh, you make it public and then wait for the windows of opportunity. When we started in 2008, you see, we came to the Minister of Finance and said, ah, these stupid people from health, you see, don't understand. But we make it public, and then uh, we just, it's happened, windows of opportunity. First window, it's flat, just flat. The government needs money. <coughs> and we repeated, oh, Prime Minister, we need more money, where? Oh, tobacco taxes, I know. Next, in half a year, economic recession, we need more money. What economic recession? But we also work with data. And first, we were rejected by the Minister of Finance. So that's a stupid, so the industry pays money, the best friend. But we proposed first, and it works. They get more money. So for our next proposals, we there, uh, they were neutral. Uh, uh, so they said, oh, let's see, your proposal is good, but just reduce a little bit ad valorem tax rate for your proposal. We say, OK, half a year passed. Government needs money. They call us. What car we can change it with? That's time we failed. Then we had presidential election. New minister of finance, Fyodor uh, Yeroshenko, came. We need more money. What tobacco taxes? Everybody because and they know it works because they have figures of revenue. So be ready. And sometimes we just need to uh, uh, wait for winters of opportunity. It's not always happen. But with good monitoring, with all good data, it's it. and also another message is if it's. Uh, maybe it's still the panel has ready. And that's much. Don't afraid smuggling. You see, it's I study tobacco taxation situation in more than uh, six, six, 60 countries. Never compensate decline of legal sales. It's no example in the world. You see, it's people smoke less. And what about the popular arguments? Oh, we get money from smugglers. They smuggling cigarettes from Ukraine. In 2008. 40 billion cigarettes were smuggled out of Ukraine. In Croatia, now only 6 billion cigarettes are sold legally, but 40, 40 billion cigarettes were smuggled from Ukraine. And um, they pay excise taxes. It's about half a billion bucks. So Ukraine government had 1 billion grivna. Oh. Then in 2011, smuggling of Ukraine decreased from 40 billion to 20 billion, twice. But the excise tax increased sixfold to three billion. So at then the, the government get three billion cigarettes. So if you just make calculations, if we, we increase taxes with, with some decline of smuggling out of the country, how much money we get? In most cases, with any reasonable forecast, you get more money from smugglers. And anyway, if the smuggling out of the country eventually disappear, you will get for more money from those who still smokes. And the message, if for those smokers who don't like high excises, if you don't like high excises, quit. So every time when we make this excise tax increase, and usually the tobacco industry increases even more, our message was tobacco industry says bloody Americans from Philip Morris wants more money from poor Ukrainian pockets. So quit. So the aim of tobacco taxation policy is not revenue. Revenue is a bonus. The main aim is health of the people. And the more people quit or at least reduce smoking, and it works in all the countries. So it's plenty of examples, especially if you uh, estimate this in long term. Because in short term, tobacco industry uses some tricks like forest telling pricing policy just to reduce revenue and something. But in long term, it works in every country. Thank you very much.